Hi, my name is Garrett Newell, and I'm a Feldman Kreis um, trainer and practitioner. I did the training in Amherst, Massachusetts, and that's how I know Moshe. So I'll say a little bit about how I got to the training because it it involves how it is that I got to know Moshe personally. Um, I was doing a master's in dance in at New York University, and I had an accident preparing my loft to be a dance studio, and I had something fall on me, and I had an upper spine injury, and it kind of made it not possible for me to pursue a professional career in dance, but it also made me more interested in movement awareness because I had to become so aware of what I was doing to stay out of pain and to you know, be able to dream of being able to dance and perform again. So I tried a lot of um, things that were around at that time. I had chiropractic treatments and I met a um, teacher, the Alexander Technique, who was also a dancer. And that helped me immensely in terms of um, learning what it is that I could do and what I had to just avoid. Um, after I... Um, finished my master's degree in dance, I decided to move to San Francisco. And I lived with a community of people that I had met previously. And we all followed the same uh, meditation teacher. And I still do follow this meditation teacher. So we were living together and had meetings where we would get together and share experiences and meditate together. And um, one night at one of these meetings, one of my housemates said to me, oh, did you meet the Feldenkrais teacher who was there? And um, of course, I'd heard of Moshe Feldenkrais because as a dance student, we were all required to read Awareness the Movement, the only thing that was in print. And in the early 70s in New York, there were no teachers of the Feldenkrais method, so I couldn't experience it, but I remember the book really impressed me. So when I heard this Feldenkrais teacher, I made a beeline to him, and the Feldenkrais teacher was Jerry Carson. And the reason that Jerry Carson was at this meeting was that he had a crush on at the time, Diane Van Anda, who later became his girlfriend. And I think he was more interested in her than he was in the meditation, but he had to pretend to be interested in the meditation to get his inroads to Diane. And Diane and I were good friends. So when um, I uh, asked Jerry for a lesson, I told him I still had some pain and he um, gave me a couple of FI lessons. And after the first lesson, I said to him, I want to learn what you know. I could feel in his hands that there was just something so different than the way I had been touched by other experts. And, um, and he said, well, um, Moshe just finished a training program in San Francisco, but we're trying to convince him to do another one. So write him a letter, tell him that you want to learn his method and see what happens. So I wrote Moshe a letter. Somewhere I have the response that I did get from Moshe. And then eventually, of course, enough people did that so that he agreed to do the Amherst training. And because I had only met and known Jerry at that point, um, I had a kind of a connection to the training already. And I was um, living in Europe at the time. And when um, Jerry contacted me to say the training was happening, he, he was really very generous with me. And he said, you don't even need to apply. You're already accepted. Um, and I'll give you a work scholarship. So, cause he knew I was just starting my career in, in dance and movement and I, that I didn't really have an established um, profession and wasn't making a lot of money at the time. And so I um, got the job, first job I had. So Jerry and Diane lived together at Shea Street with Moshe. It was a beautiful, big New England home that belonged to a couple of professors at the University of Amherst, I think at Amherst College. And um, they were away for the summer. And so they rented this big house and it had about four or five bedrooms and um, nice um, big yard. It was quite a nice place. So first I was assigned to be the cook and um, I had heard that Moshe was supposed to have uh, less salt in his diet than he liked. I think there was some mention of some circulatory problems. And Diane and Jerry and I at that time were all vegetarians. So I tried to cook for him my best, you know, non-salt vegetarian meals. And I also um, have Polish ancestry. And I was trying to recreate some of the dishes that I knew my Polish grandmother had made for us like stuffed cabbage and things like that. And um, he complained about there being no meat and he complained about there being no salt. <laughs> and so 
I got, he didn't say it directly to me, but he found out a few days later that one of the students in the training had done a, a course in Cordon Bleu cooking. So he got the job of being the cook and Moshe got to eat all the rich French food, fatty food that he wasn't supposed to be eating. Um, but he was happy that he had somebody who cooked for him in the way that he wanted to. Um, eat. So he had um, very often in the uh, Amherst training, you'll hear him making fun of health foods. And it's partly because Jerry and Diane lived with him and they were eating, you know, muesli and cereals, and nuts and things that you would call health foods. And he, um, he just kind of couldn't understand how you could live that way, live off those things, because it just was so antithetical to, um, to his uh, background, his way of thinking. And so I got um, the job of being the house cleaner instead. And so I would go at least once a week and, and clean the house. And I usually went when nobody was there, when they were doing lunch um, pauses, when um, Moshe was resting or when he was doing FIs after class. And I remember the first time that I neatened up his desk because it was just chaotic and I just put everything in little piles and he was really upset with me and he said you ruined my order and I said but there wasn't any order it was completely chaotic but he said that was my order <laughs> and so I learned to respect that you know some people have that kind of order and that I just stayed away from the desk for the rest of the time that I was house cleaning but one story that I have that I, I think is just very sweet because the image has just never really left me that um, one time at lunch, Moshe was back at the house and I found him um, near his bedroom, fast asleep on the floor. And he was lying on the floor and he had a roller maybe behind his thighs and he had one foot on the thigh and one hand behind his head. And he was sound asleep, but he was in the middle of an awareness and movement lesson. And it was just one of the most beautiful images I have of him just lying there, you know, just kind of ready to go, but just absolutely sound asleep. So it was wonderful to have those kinds of moments and, and visions of him that I wouldn't maybe normally have had a chance to have. And he was also very mischievous because this house um, was next door to a house that had a swimming pool. And it was a really, really, those summers were really, really hot. And he used to say to me, he said, should we climb over the wall and go break into the swimming pool? And so he had this really lovely kind of mischievous side to him that really wanted to, you know, do things that were kind of out of the box, out of the ordinary. We never did break into the swimming pool, but it was a nice uh, idea of his. So um, Moshe could never remember my name. I had a, my nickname um, when I was in the Amherst training was Midge, which of course every um, American at that time knew was the best friend of Barbie, the doll that was created to be the best friend, the Barbie doll. So it was a very well-known name in America, but obviously Moshe hadn't really couldn't really comprehend it. And one of the reasons I changed my name to Garrett was because it was so difficult in a lot of the languages in, in Europe for someone to pronounce it or to understand where it came from. So I went back to Garrett from Margaret. So he used to call me Diane's friend when he couldn't remember my name. He would call me Diane's friend or he'd call me the housekeeper or house cleaner. Um, but the nickname has more of a story to it. There were another nickname that he called me has more of a story to it. And it came up when um, um, uh, they were finishing the, the last week of Amherst, I think week nine of, of the first year of Amherst, the um, transcripts for it. And Arlene had said to me, we were on a committee together, and she had said to me, why is, why is Moshe calling you the guru gal? And I said, she said, you know, were you a guru? And I said, no, absolutely not. But I had a guru. And that was what he, what he associated me with. So one time, Diane and I were, we didn't want him to know about our, our teacher. He was a young Indian who came from, came to America, made a big splash. And Moshe made fun of every spiritual teacher that he heard anything about. And we just didn't want to expose our teacher to his ridicule. So one day when Moshe was busy doing functional integration lessons after class, we were at Shea Street and we decided to put a video of our teacher onto the cassette machine, which was kept, one of the machines was kept in the house. And Moshe came back early and we didn't have time to turn it off in time. So he sat in front of the TV and looked at it, he stared and he grunted and he thought, oh my God, the next day we're really gonna hear, you know, this opinion of his about this, this teacher. 
Um, so we were really quite surprised when I'm going to um, just look for this this quote. So we were quite surprised when the next day we came into class and Moshe said, this is on June 22nd, 1981, if you want to look it up. He said, by the way, I heard yesterday, he said, there's this Indian guru here. He called him, he called him Maharishi. That's not his name. His name was Maharaji. Um, he said, I found that I could understand him. He actually does what we teach here. And Moshe started imitating him. And unfortunately, he walked in when at the end of this event, our teacher got up and danced. And I, I was just so embarrassed because I thought it's bad enough that he sees him, but then he sees him get up and dance and everybody in the crowd is kind of you know dancing along with him. But he wasn't phased at all. He said, and the way that he, he danced, he said, it's, it was like Nijinsky. He put his foot down and you could feel it go through his hand. And that really convinced me that Moshe saw deeper than the surface of people. Because I would have seen, you know, all these people excited and this guy dancing. And as an outsider, I would have thought it was ridiculous. But Moshe saw something very essential about this teacher. So the next day he said, um, and the teacher says, um, just stop thinking, stop having concepts and ideas, just rely on your experience. And he said, and that's just what you can see that many disciplines concur with what it is that we do here. So he was kind of really impressed that this teacher had something that he felt was in common. So this became a really nice contact between Moshe and I because he would ask me a lot of questions about him. He'd ask me about, you know, what my experience was, what the meditation was like. And then he would ask really funny questions. He would say, well, how many followers does he have? And I didn't know at the time it was millions. And he said, well, why does he have so many followers and I don't? <laughs> I said, well, Moshe, he teaches something that's so easy. You can learn it in an afternoon session. It's just techniques of meditation. I said, you know, what you teach is so profound and takes a long time to learn. So it's a very, you can't compare the um, number of, of uh, followers, you know, that he has to the number of followers that you have. Um, but this was a really wonderful bond between us. And in the... Um, the last time that I visited Moshe was in uh, Tel Aviv. We were there for the fourth year of the training. And we had, uh, those of us who knew Moshe got to visit him in his um, bed. He was really just in bed the whole time there. And he was just very sweet when I went to see him and he was very quiet because he was, you know, mostly not so well at that time. And he said to me, he turned to me and he said, I think I know what your guru is talking about said, I think I'm having that experience. And it was just so beautiful, this kind of real inner depth of his that he could express and he could feel, you know, when you're in that transition time, which he was, you know, there's something eternal, you know, that's there, whether your body is going to hold on to it or not. And that was a very special memory that I have of, of Mache. But another funny story that I wanted to tell was that um, after Moshe had his first stroke, he was in a clinic in um, Switzerland and I was working in Munich at the time. And I think I went with Jerry Carson to visit him in this clinic and it was a Bircher Brenner clinic and Dr. Bircher Brenner was the inventor of muesli and using muesli and, and, and you know, health foods as a way to, um, to recover and regenerate. And so I teased Moshe, I said, see, all that time you made fun of health foods and now look where you've ended up in the Bershaw Brenner Clinic. <laughs> and he was really complaining about the food there. And he said to Jerry and I said, can you sneak me in some chocolate, please? I really miss chocolate. <laughs> so we had to kind of, you know, sneak him in some chocolate because I can imagine someone with his attitude having to live on that kind of food was not really his, uh, his uh, best, his wish. He couldn't bring his French cook with him to the Bircher Brenner Clinic. <laughs> so um, yeah, those are some of my stories of, of Moshe. I think I had a very kind of, um, what's it called, a kind of soft relationship with him. I can't say that any of my interactions with him were about my learning something from him, my personal interactions with him, whereas other people, you know, have more of those kinds of stories. But I felt like he had some kind of respect for Diane and I and our choices, and that he had some um, whimsical side to him that he could express with someone that he, you know, he didn't, you know, I was a student, obviously, but I think he didn't really have to 
um, treat me like that because I was around the house a lot. So I was, you know, somebody who was just there. And I know several times in the Amherst training when we were doing things like I do, I have a real strong memory of this lesson with the um, arms moving. And he was saying, oh, and look how well the house cleaner does it. <laughs> <laughs> because he couldn't remember my name so he's called me the house cleaner and then one time we were upside down doing something he said I can't recognize you by your ass and I said Moshe I said I'm your house cleaner <laughs> so he was just had this kind of really you know funny um and, and lovely just warm relationship and I really have those memories very strongly of him so that's what um, I would like to share with you. I really want to thank Cynthia for asking me to do this and to, um, um, yeah, to also just really remember Moshe and remember what, what a precious person he was. And, and I was really quite fortunate to have that kind of light, um, whimsical sometimes contact with him. So thank you very much.